I recently had the privilege of Zooming with over 100 Every Nation pastors who serve in Asia. And I think what we talked about, the idea of biblical preaching, would be helpful to all of our Every Nation pastors and preachers all over the world. So here we go. We started in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Very familiar scripture to all of us. And here's what Paul, the old preacher, the old minister, uh, was saying to Timothy, a younger pastor, younger preacher, less experienced minister. And I think for all emerging leaders and preachers, it's always good to listen to and learn from established, experienced leaders and preachers, especially when they're people like Paul who wrote the Bible. So all of us can learn from this. Verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom. Now, Paul right here takes this charge he's about to give uh, to level 15 out of 10. Okay, he is raising the stakes here. Not only is he using the phrase, I charge you. In other words, I'm not giving you a suggestion. When he says, I charge you, that raises the stakes. But then look at what he says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. So think about it. Sometimes we, I I know growing up, going to the Episcopal church, um, you could be acting like a kid, loud and rambunctious. But when you walked into the sanctuary, you were supposed to be silent suddenly. And this was sacred space. And this was the presence of God. and, And there was something different. There were things you could tell a bad joke outside, but when you walked in there, now you're in the presence of God and somehow you couldn't now. God's everywhere and I know he listens to everything, but the point is we felt like there was this sacredness. This is what he's saying. I charge you, not just me, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. Then he lifts it even higher. Who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Listen, this is like, you know, people say, look, I, I, I promise you, what I'm saying is true, or I swear it's true, or I swear on my mother's grave, or put your hand on the Bible, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Whatever in your culture or in your mind raises the stakes of what's being said, that's what Paul's doing here. I charge you, not just me, in the presence of God and Jesus, the one who's going to judge. Okay, so now now he's got their attention. Okay, he's about to say something that I really need to listen to. So look what he says. After this great charge, verse 2, preach the word. Wait a minute. Of course, Timothy's the pastor. Of course he's going to preach the word. No, no. We're raising the stakes here. This is a serious word. Preach the word. It should go without saying when we talk to other pastors, the idea of preach the word. But Paul didn't just leave it at that. This is the Apostle Paul writing to a pastor, and writing in this this letter that would apply to any pastor. And he stated the obvious. Preach the word. That's the job of the pastor. That's the call of the pastor. That's what we're supposed to do with our lives. That's that's, That's what we're here for, to preach the word. Now, it's common today to try to avoid the word preach and the idea of preacher. So rather than preachers, we want to be communicators of information. And I know there are a lot of people who substitute and they don't want to refer to themselves as preachers, but communicators, or because Keynote and PowerPoint and whatever else is so popular now, we become presenters. So we become communicators or presenters. And I think, uh, look, if if you use these tools while you preach, that's fine. Use them, but don't let the, the tools of Keynote and, and PowerPoint and whatever else you might use. Don't let that change you from being a preacher to a presenter. And that is the temptation that we become a presenter. We're not communicators, we're not presenters, and we're not giving motivational speeches. We're preachers. The Apostle Paul says to this young pastor, preach the word. Then he says this, be ready in season and out of season. And then he goes through what this preaching includes reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Those aren't words we use in modern English that often, that much. The NIV says it like this, correct, rebuke, and encourage. And a a good sermon, a good sermon series, a good 
pulpit rotation will sometimes one sermon will do all three. It, it will correct, it will rebuke, and it will encourage. Sometimes maybe there's a whole sermon that's correction, doctrinal or theological or, or something that's being corrected. Sometimes it's all encouragement. Sometimes it's a combination of two or three. And maybe there are other things being done as well. But he's saying to correct, rebuke, encourage. Why? And he describes in these next two verses, I think the world we live in now, uh, the COVID mixed with internet choices that we all make, uh, not going to church, different places in the world for different time periods, but picking and choosing what we want to hear and clicking off of things we don't want to hear or muting it or turning the volume down so it looks like we're on there, but we're really not. This is what he describes, verse 3. So he's saying, preach the word. Here's why. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. In other words, you can find teachers to teach what you want to hear. Not necessarily what we need to hear, but what we want to hear. Whatever our current thing that we're passionate about, we can find someone online to tell us what we already know, what we already believe, what we already want to hear to encourage us and how we're thinking, how we're living, what we're doing, what we're not doing, what we're avoiding. It's out there and we pick and choose today. And he's warning about this, verse 4. And they will turn away from listening to the truth. And as a result, he says, wander into myths. There's a lot of that going on, maybe now more than ever in my lifetime, because of not physically going to church in different parts of the world and having so many options to pick and choose what we want. When we're in a local congregation, we're not picking and choosing what we want. Uh, as preachers, we believe that we go and hear from God and we walk into that pulpit with a word from God, from the word of God, and we preach. And when we're part of a spiritual family, a spiritual community, we're hearing that word and then we're living it out together. But when we're disconnected and disjointed, we can cut that one off and pick and choose whatever we want to hear. And I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's a good thing. I think God puts us in spiritual communities so we can learn together and live it out together. But when we're disconnected, we hear what we want and we may or may not live it out. We may or may not have people around us who are hearing the same thing and working on the same things in their lives. So Paul is exhorting Timothy to preach the word. Why? Because the, there, there's coming times when people will push away truth and they'll avoid truth and they'll find what they want to hear and run with that. Now the context of preaching, because sometimes we wonder what makes something preaching versus lecturing? What makes something preaching versus communicating some, some religious ideas? What makes something preaching versus presenting a presentation? What is the difference? I think with preaching, the difference is the content and the context. The content. We preach God's Word. When we're giving a motivational speech, it may or may not have anything to do with God's Word, or we might have a good motivational speech, and we attach a Bible verse ripped out of its context to that nice motivational story. Uh, there's nothing wrong with motivating people, but let's not be confused about preaching the Word and giving a motivational speech with a Bible verse attached. They're different. They're different things. So what makes something preaching? What makes a sermon different than a lecture? It's the content it's the Word of God, but it's also the context. When it is a worship service, when it's God's people gathering together and we bring the Word with someone who is called to pastor, called to preach, that's preaching a sermon. Uh, that, that's what we're talking about, the context of worship. Worship starts with a calling of God's people out of the world into a place of worship, out of the secular into the sacred, calling God's people together to worship, to worship in song, to worship in sacrament, to worship in supplication, and to worship in sermon. And after that fourfold worship experience happens together, we start with a call to worship, we worship together, and then we're sent on mission. 
We call to worship, we send on mission after we've heard the sermon preached and after we've prayed together and, and partaken of the sacraments, worshiped in song, we go on mission. That's the context of preaching a sermon. Now, I want to end with some thoughts from Paul when he wrote to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 1. And um, here's what he says in, in this, this, this text I want to look at to close. It gives us the why preach and what to preach. Why should we preach and what should we preach? Here we go, verse 20, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God. Now listen, that's what we live to do. We live to please God. So we're about to be told what pleases God. We preach to please God. We serve everything about the Christian life is to please God. So it says, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach or other translations and even the footnote in the ESV says, through the folly of preaching. It pleased God through the folly of preaching to save those who believe. Why do we preach? Because it pleases God. Why preach? The ultimate reason, the ultimate motive is because it pleases God to save people through preaching. I don't need a better reason than that. I don't need a better motive than that. I don't need a better purpose or goal than that. We preach because it pleases God. What do we preach? Then he says, for the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. You know, we, are, we have churches filled with people who have demands and we have churches filled with people who are seeking something. But here it says, the Jews demand signs, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ. No matter what the people demand, no matter what the people seek, we preach Christ. And there's what he says, we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. So I want to close with that thought. Why do we preach? To please God. What do we preach? No matter what the people demand, no matter what crowdsourcing tells us, no matter what people want, demand, desire, or seek, we preach Christ crucified. Right in the center of preaching is Christ and the cross. And what does God do with that? He is pleased to save through that preaching. So what do I want to say to everyone here? If I could raise the stakes, raise it up to the highest level of urgency I possibly can, preach the word.